Welcome on a journey to discover how our bodies respond to extremes. I'm Nick, an intensive care doctor from London. I'm really passionate about treating patients whose bodies are pushed to the absolute physiological limits, needing life support to help them recover. In the interests of science, we explore mountains, oceans, deserts, jungles, and frozen tundras, comparing how the critically unwell struggle to adapt to illness with my body's response to Earth's harshest environments. I've just arrived at 4,000 meters for the first time in this trip. I'm really feeling the altitude. We want to see how my breathing and my heart and my brain respond to this, so we're going to do some experiments. Is that the wrong way? Disaster. I don't know what we proved there. We're going to measure my respiratory rate, how big my regular volumes of breath are. We're going to measure the percentage of oxygen saturations in my blood. And then we're going to do some slightly crazy tests, like a bleep test, to see how far I can push my heart at this altitude. Oh God. Fuck! So intense. I can't breathe. Mate, it doesn't really matter because we can just cut this anyway. I've stopped it, man. I've stopped it. Fuck I'm sorry. To see how my brain performs with less oxygen, we're going to do a simple test and see how many things I can name of a common list of subjects we've been using and compare that to sea level. Apples, pears, lemons, oranges, grapefruit. So that was interesting. I could really feel that my brain wasn't moving as quickly as it would be. It was like a sort of cloud and there was a delay between each thought process. This relates to patients who are very unwell when they have less oxygen getting to their brain. They first might become confused and then as it progresses and get worse, they get very sleepy and drowsy and eventually they become unconscious. So one of the things that increases as you go higher in altitude is the size of your normal breath, what we call in medicine your tidal volume. So I've made a crude spirometer to try and measure that using what kit we could find. So that has gone to 550. This is at 4,000 meters. As you gain altitude, the effect of gravity from Earth and the weight pushing down of the atmosphere above becomes less. So there's less air pressure. So for each breath of the same volume, less oxygen molecules are coming into our lungs, which means less oxygen is passing into our blood. So our heart is pumping blood with less oxygen around our body. This low oxygen is detected by receptors within our blood. It leads to an immediate response from our fight or flight or adrenaline system. So our heart rate increases, as does the strength at which our heart beats. So with each beat, more blood is being pumped around the body. We breathe faster, we breathe deeper. These are all immediate changes that help combat being at altitude. Across the globe, humanity has evolved to thrive at high altitude. The low oxygen state has created a natural selection pressure, which has forced humanity to change genetically, physiologically. Where we are in the Himalayas, the two obvious groups are the Tibetans and a subgroup of those, the Sherpas, famous for their mountaineering exploits. They've evolved to combat the low oxygen by having bigger lung volumes and moving in and out more oxygen and carbon dioxide. They're also able to move oxygen slightly more efficiently from their lungs into their blood. But the most fascinating things are happening on a small scale within the cells. So the mitochondria, the power plants of the cells, are more efficient at using oxygen to make energy and the blood flow on a small level called the microcirculation is improved, allowing improved oxygen delivery. Freediving is swimming underwater on just one breath of air. It's been practiced for centuries. It's now a growing competitive sport with athletes pushing their physiological limit, able to dive to extraordinary depths of over 200 meters and hold their breath for up to 10 minutes. The Sama people are an ethnic group of seafaring nomads who've been roaming the waters of the coast of Malaysia, the Philippines and Indonesia. They free dive for a living, spending hours and hours and hours in the water and from a very young age. Given free diving is a dangerous activity, it may have led to a selection pressure driving evolution. Recent studies suggest one thing that may have evolved is their spleen. This is an organ, it's involved in the immune system and breaking down red blood cells. 
One of the things that happens when you free dive is it squeezes, it contracts, putting more red blood cells out into your circulation. So some recent studies suggest that the genetics of these, these amazing people, the SAMA, have evolved and changed over time, giving them bigger spleens. So more work is, is needed to fully understand this, and it may have implications in modern medicine. To approximate the residual volume, I'm going to use one of the gas laws called Boyle's law. What this says is if the temperature remains the same, pressure is inversely related to volume. Put another way, if you double the pressure, you halve the volume and vice versa. So out here in the water, what I'm going to do is dive to 10 metres where the atmospheric pressure is double. So at the surface, we have one atmosphere. Every 10 metres that you go down, you add on another atmosphere. So I dive down to 10 metres. I'm going to blow out all the air in my lungs, leaving just the residual volume at 10 metres. I'm then going to come up to the surface, and as I do that, that one residual volume is going to double in size because I'm halving the pressure. So the volume will expand. It will then let me blow out one residual volume and we'll measure it here on the surface. To demonstrate Boyle's law and this concept, we're going to take two bottles down to 10 metres. Both are the same volume at the surface, but one's filled with water and one's filled with air. And what you should see is as the pressure doubles, the volume of the air-filled bottle will halve, but the other one will stay the same. Blackouts are one of the risks associated with freediving, and they occur when not enough oxygen gets to the brain. It's interesting that they occur near the surface, and they're called shallow water blackouts. And the reason for this is to do with pressure. As you go deep, pressure in the chest and on the lungs, and therefore in the oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen increases. So you actually have plenty of oxygen at depth. But as you come to the surface and that pressure reduces, the amount of oxygen getting into the blood and therefore into the brain reduces, and it can reduce quite quickly as the pressure changes. People black out near the surface. This is actually relevant, or the pressure changes are relevant to our experiments and work at altitude as well. Because altitude is high, but the pressure is lower, and therefore that's why the oxygen is low there as well. So these two are linked, so are linking the deep water and the high altitude. stretchers like just like step by step and every breath is difficult um, it makes you understand a little bit more just how like small movements like that could be so difficult because if you're healthy and you're watching them and you're helping them stand up just standing up is difficult or just taking steps like 15 feet is difficult and now I know <laughs> yeah, so progressively as the tr as the altitudes got higher and higher, the breathing's got harder and harder and I felt my heart beat faster and faster. Uh, and it's obviously reached a climax today where I've been walking ridiculously slowly and my my breath has just been so so deep and so heavy. Um but but yeah, I'm looking forward to to getting down and breathing some uh, proper oxygen. I had it was a long time ago through an accident. I had a pneumothorax. It was a partial partial collapse of of only one wing of the lung. And yeah, I, I could feel that. It's very similar. I think it's comparable. You try to breathe, but you don't get enough oxygen in in your body. Yeah. I think especially in competitions, people tend to push themselves beyond their limits because they want to reach a certain number, a certain goal, for example, a national record or world record. So that's why people black out more in competition. There's always a relaxation aspect in the discipline. It's similar to uh, relaxation, to yoga exercise when you, are, you start to decrease your heartbeat. So it's, I would resume, summary that, as a well-being attitude that you will not get with any other sport. If you do a marathon, yeah, there's no way you're going to get some well-being. It's always fighting. It's very hard to, to run or even swimming. But in freediving, before you become a very good freediver, 
you need to learn how to relax and how to decrease your heartbeat. Um, for the depths, it's a little bit different. You still need also some cardio training, some uh, stamina, some uh, resistance training, of course, and you go to the gym also to, to train your legs, your arms, depending on the discipline. But moreover, you need to be adapted to the, to the depth, to the pressure. And then this is when it takes time. You cannot improve from 40 meters to 70 meters just in, in one or two months. You need your body to get adapted to, to the depth. And step by step, you need to build this confidence. You need to build this adaptation from your body to the depth. It's very important, otherwise you're gonna take, take a lot of uh, very dangerous risk. And what, what are the... I really, because I'm obsessed by freedom, I really believe that everybody has to choose what, what to do in life and passions and anything. So um, I try always to, to relax as much as possible. So my body needs less oxygen. At a certain point, I feel like I don't need to breathe anymore. And uh, so that to me is the best uh, moment for freediving.